All right, good morning. Happy Halloween. Um, this is low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit, but I didn't need a wig and I do not know how to play Master of Puppets, but that's fine. I hope you all had a great uh, weekend. Um, I know that last week we took some time uh, for you to take the midterm. So I do want to spend a bunch of time today going over the midterm, uh, some of the more difficult questions, um, debriefing that, talking about your essay for the course. Uh, and then we'll start to dive into the role of conversations, uh, talking and listening in communication. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So um, I also want to take some time to talk about the feedback that I received from you all um, a couple weeks ago as well for the course. Okay, so uh, the midterm grades and feedback are up. So um, if you haven't already, if you check on Canvas, you'll see the grade that you received out of 200. Um, you'll also see uh, comments from me that detail the score that you received on the short essay portion. I've given you some feedback on each of those, and then I've given you a cumulative total. Uh, so the midterm was out of 200 points. So if you want to know your percentage score, right, take the score that you got and divide it by two. So um, if, for instance, you got 200 divided by two, that's 100%. All right, so um, half of those, right? So 100 points were from the multiple choice and 100 points were from the short essay. Uh, each of those short essays uh, questions were uh, 33 points and uh, everybody got a free point on the short essay portion. Uh, the average grade was in the low to mid uh, B range, which was pretty solid. Um, the highest score was 100%. Uh, basically, the only way that I curve is if the highest score is less than 100, then I'll take the difference between that score and 100 and add that to everybody's. But because the highest score was uh, 200, um, your grade is finalized there. Uh, question number 14 was talking about different types of listeners, like content or people-oriented listeners. Uh, but that's a topic we started to explore in class, uh, but one we'll be getting into more for this week. So I didn't feel like uh, that was necessarily a fair question. If you got it right, uh, no change. But if you didn't get that right, then four points were added. At the very beginning of the term, uh, I told you to regularly check Canvas announcements for updates. Um, I also told you earlier in the term that there would be um, an update on Canvas that if you completed it, uh, would add extra credit onto your grade. And so uh, that was posted uh, last week on Canvas. So if you checked the Canvas announcements, um, you probably noticed that there were a number of, um, or that there was a secret code word uh, there on Canvas. So um, this one here, right? Um, so I mentioned that if you entered that extra credit and sent it to me through an email, that I would add extra credit. So those of you who sent me last week an email that said pickles got four points of extra credit. Thank you for listening. And again, a reminder to continue to regularly check those updates on Canvas and your email. Uh, if you're not able to uh, catch that update last week. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the midterm. I'm going to do a bit of a breakdown of some of the more difficult questions. Uh, but if you'd like to chat with me outside of class, either through email or for an office hour appointment about the score that you received, uh, please let me know. Uh, if you did not get the score that you wanted on the exam, uh, there is an extra credit opportunity that will add 20 points or 2% on to grade at the end of the term. Uh, more on that to come as we continue to move along. Um, also, uh, there are uh, assignments like the final exam, uh, the FA, and your attendance and Canvas prompts that will be coming up as well. So, uh, temperament is the best answer to this first question because personality, right, is a combination of nature and nurture, but it involves things that culturally we've developed as people over time. Uh, a genetic or biological predisposition would be temperament. So temperament would be the best answer to this question. Uh, I'm not going to go through every question, but if there's a question you'd like me to discuss further or you'd like me to talk about a bit after class, please let me know. Uh, communication disposition is the best answer here because 
It's how we choose to engage or not in communication. So one of the spectrums there was approach versus avoidance. Uh, so some of these other ones like cognitive dispositions are more about how we think rather than how we communicate, right? Uh, regulating is how we manage our interactions with other people. So Dave tapping his watch to indicate that we're out of time um, would not be complimenting because there's nothing here about his verbal communication. He's not saying we're running out of time. Um, it's not accenting or repeating a verbal message because it's not being given, right? It's regulating the communication encounter uh, by trying to end the conversation. Unit group theory says the dominant groups shape perception of reality, right? In particular, unit group theory states that dominant groups have control of language, for instance, the use of racist or sexist language that defines and constrains individuals. Noise is what gets in the way or distorts the message, right? So uh, it is hurting our ability to transmit a message. So if you're thinking to yourself, I'm hungry, your stomach is rumbling while um, you're trying to talk to Jenna, that would be noise that's impacting or distorting the conversation. Feedback is your verbal or nonverbal response, right? So nodding your head while responding to somebody. Enforcing, it's not one of the six functions. We talked a little bit about the abstraction ladder, right? So the ladder of abstraction is something very general to something very specific. So thing to, to computer mouse is a variation in abstraction in how we communicate. A dismissing fearful style, uh, dismissing attachment style means that you value yourself right, but you don't necessarily value uh, relationships with other people. Preoccupied means that you value relationships with others, but not with yourself. Secure means that you value both yourself and the other person. Face work is the way that we manage our public persona, right? Uh, ethnocentrism is a belief your own culture is better. Whereas attribution error is when you are attributing somebody's personality to their mood. A Zoom meeting with a close friend is interpersonal, right? Because it's meaningful exchange between two people. A text sent to a group of five people is not interpersonal communication because interpersonal communication would be between two people. This would qualify under group communication. So think back to the pyramid. Group communication would be a larger set of people, such as five people. Uh, interpersonal communication is primarily between two. Um, norms are not hard-coded rules. They are unwritten, right? We don't do that here. Um, rules would be hard-coded. So for instance, a constitution would be hard-coded rules. Tone of voice is considered nonverbal communication, right? Verbal communication is how we use language. Nonverbal is how you say it. So your pitch, your tone of voice, all of those things tie to vocalics. Uh, so that would be the best answer here. So I want to talk a little bit about the essay portion and some of the things that I think went well and uh, some common notes that I saw here. Uh, this question here about ethnocentrism, right? I was looking for a clear definition of ethnocentrism, the belief that somebody's own culture is better than that of other cultures. So defining that in your answer was really important. The four factors of collective self-esteem, right? So those would be things such as membership, esteem, or importance to identity. We broke down those four. It's how you value yourself in relation to being a member of the group. A lot of um, good responses were ones that talked about membership, esteem, and how much you value the group itself. Um, and if there are stereotypes made about that group, that's going to impact how you relate to that group. Strategies to reduce ethnocentrism. So the best responses, were the ones that talked about cultural intelligence, right? And we're using elements of cultural intelligence to say that we can better understand and be motivated to learn and to accept other perspectives. So a bit of a range on this one. Those were some of the major things that I was looking for. Communication theories. Uh, so people who went with this question, uh, not just used a good range of theories, saw a lot of uncertainty reduction theory, a lot of unity group theory, um, less in terms of face negotiation theory and a couple others. Some people chose things like self-concept or ideal self. Those are concepts, right, or ideas. Those are not a, not theories. So theories would be a broader lens or way of looking at uh, and making sense of an issue, right? So um, 
people who were contracting those theories generally did a good job. But one thing to note here about muted group theory, right, is muted group theory is about language. So the idea that a dominant group is able to control language um, and impact how we look at the world. Uh, for example, some people use an example talking about indigenous concepts of land versus Western concepts of land, right? Um, some of those contrasts were ways that that theory was used well. Other people were saying, well, muted group theory isn't in this conversation. It is if we're using language. So focusing on how language impacts the interaction was a good response in applying that. Perception, right? So perception is about attending, organizing, and interpreting. I uh, saw a wide range of justifications here, but if you justified and explained which of those three stages you felt was the best one, I think you did a great job here. Emotional intelligence, right? The definition of emotional intelligence is that you understand and engage with your own emotions as well as the emotions of other people, right? So we better perceive if we understand the emotions that we and others are feeling. Um, and uh, some good answers here on culture, having good concrete examples, for instance, in this culture, nonverbal behavior like kissing on the cheek is considered normal, but to an outsider, this would be seen as potentially disrespectful. Uh, examples that were really concrete and clear did a really good job of addressing that one. Interpersonal, right? So uh, this is said about three or four different times. This is TRA. A couple people chose interpersonal. Uh, this is intrapersonal or communication with yourself. Right, so a couple of people had some good responses here talking about how we use it to fulfill uh, our own needs, for instance, helping us to establish an internal dialogue, figuring out what we want in our own lives. Uh, I really liked some points here that were made about how we do interpersonal communication without thinking about it, right? You have an internal dialogue without directly engaging with other people uh, or even thinking about doing interpersonal communication. You have a little voice in your head. Um, so uh, good responses were identifying both needs that could and couldn't be fulfilled. So some of the social and belonging needs are things that interpersonal communication cannot fulfill. Um, so that's generally what I was looking for there. Um, and looking at examples of how you use interpersonal communication, um, people who were able to speak to their own experiences, such as getting ready for the day or thinking through an issue or topic that they are a little bit anxious about, those were good responses in addressing that problem. So again, um, there's a bit of a range in people's scores overall, but I did want to go over some of the more difficult questions as well as what I was looking for on the short essay. It's not grading the short essay based on how perfect your quality of the writing was, but about your ability to engage with the content and use that content in an accurate way, of course. Any questions about the midterm exam? Any questions you would like me to go over? Anything more generally? We are going to have a final exam at the end of the term. The final exam is structured exactly like the midterm, but the final exam is going to cover content from the course from this point forward. Um, it is cumulative in the sense that everything we talk about is building off of itself, right? We're talking about talking and listening this week, but uh, we have to understand what it means to uh, do communication in order to understand how those things work. So I definitely recommend you dedicate most of your time um, I'll be giving practice questions uh, and a study guide two weeks before the final exam as well. All right. So that is part one. The next thing that I want to talk with you about is the recording and reflection essay. So this is coming up three weeks from today. Uh, so I think that you have a good amount of time to uh, practice. Uh, start drafting and outlining uh, and developing a timeline for yourself, what I really encourage you to do is to work backwards. Think about the deadline and think about what you can do between now and that deadline to get that assignment done. So what I'm asking you to do is to have a conversation with somebody else. And prior to that conversation, you should consent to that person being recorded. Uh, so um, say, hey, I'm going to have my phone over here, or I'm going to have a microphone, and I'm going to record this conversation. Is that okay with you? Right? Uh, make sure that the other person agrees to that. It can be with somebody that's significant to you, such as a friend, a family member, um, a roommate, somebody that you see as important and that you're able to communicate with in your life. What I'll be asking you to do is that after you have that conversation, 10 to 15 minutes, can also cut a 10 to 15 minute snippet if you want to, is to transcribe that conversation. 
if I transcribe, right, I mean for you to type up um, almost like a play the dialogue that's happening between you and that person. So um, you're writing up what exactly happened, and you can use things like brackets um, to indicate things like stage direction, somebody's non response, so on. So transcribe that conversation. Once you have finished that transcription, I'm going to be asking you to use a two to three page essay to talk about what you've reflected on and learned from your conversation with that person. For instance, you might think about your own listening style, how you're speaking to that person, what elements of verbal and nonverbal communication you're using, and so on. Right? So, um, to be clear, there's the transcription that does not count toward the two to three pages. There's the content of the essay that would be two to three pages, right? And then there would be a reference or work cited list in addition to that uh, that would be citing from the textbook. So, you do want to make sure to include both in text and work cited in APA, MLA, or in Chicago uh, as you're working through this. And what I really encourage you to do in this first week is to really take some time to think about what conversation it is that you would like to have. Who do you want to talk to? And uh, who might you reach out to this week in order to make that conversation happen? Uh, if you procrastinate on this, right, you're not going to have a person to have a conversation with. Um, and if you are not having a conversation with somebody and filling something in, uh, it will be very clear. So I definitely recommend to take some time in advance to work through that. Transcribing can take a little bit, right? Uh, generally speaking, at least about double the length of time that it takes you to have the conversation itself. So um, just know that that part of the process can take a little bit. And in particular, since we'll be talking about talking and listening this week, you might be drawing from some of these ideas to help to fill in uh, the content for this essay too. So um, on Canvas, I've included a rubric for this assignment, and I've also included um, an example outline that I'll be sharing here in just a second. So recording and reflection due on November 20th. On Canvas, right, you turn in the following, you can either turn it in as a single file or submit multiple files, the full transcription, the two to three page essay, and the work cited or reference list. Um, I am grading using this rubric. So one of the parts is the transcription. You have the full transcription of your conversation with that person. You do not need to send me the audio or video file of the conversation. You just need to provide uh, the transcription of that conversation with somebody else. And I'll be providing an example as well to show you what that transcription can look like. Um, but it should include a good, clear transcription. Um, work on those clean conventions, right? Break up larger sentences, use clauses to separate parts of sentences, work on proper capitalization, proper nouns, um, and avoid uh, some of those grammatical errors. You do need to include in-text citations and a reference list, right? Not including those when citing from the book. For this assignment would be plagiarism, which would be a zero on the assignment or zero in the course. So uh, please uh, do not plagiarize and make sure to draw from the cited material. Uh, the content, right? What I'm looking for is for you to really draw from rich examples from your conversation with that person, uh, as well as key concepts and ideas from interpersonal communication to examine and make sense of that conversation with somebody else. Right, so you're gaining insight by looking at your own conversation and thinking about how these ideas and interpersonal communication help us to make sense of it. And then organization, using good paragraph structures, introduction, conclusion, and body points to help to organize the paper and the main ideas. Again, I'm happy to look over rough drafts or outlines if you send those to me in advance and provide you feedback on some of the things that I'm noticing and some things to continue to work on. So you'll notice here that I have an example outline. You're welcome to download this or use this as you're working through uh, the essay. Um, and again, I'll be posting some additional example material that will help you as you're gearing up for this assignment. So um, the outline would include an introduction where you're talking about the basics of the conversation. Uh, who were you talking to and when? What was the conversation that happened? Uh, including a preview of the main ideas that we'll be covering in the conversation. The body points, so I recommend you focus on a concept or idea in interpersonal communication for each of those body points, drawing from parts of your conversations, 
uh, and showing how those conversations link uh, to that concept. For instance, maybe you're choosing to talk about how you are a very time-oriented listener, and that's something that you learned as a result of your conversation. You might use examples here to show that you were saying things such as, I only have so long here, or I really need to go to my next meeting over the course of the conversation that link to the idea of being a time-oriented listener. Um, so I recommend two to three body paragraphs that really go over some key concepts or ideas. Uh, one big one that we'll be going over this week that would be an excellent candidate for including uh, is social penetration theory. Uh, so we'll be talking about that and the ways that uh, we engage in communication in that way. And then finally, including a conclusion where you're reminding us about the details of your conversation, uh, the main things that you've learned, and why you feel like those observations and discoveries have mattered, and what you know about how you communicate, and what you've learned from that process. Um, I've seen some people who have completed and shared some really cool um, transcriptions and conversations. For example, uh, people who have talked with a grandparent and learned a whole lot about their own life experiences and challenges growing up. People have talked about um, going through a similar issue that a parent went through when they were growing up, right? So a lot of people have had some really interesting insights and reflection through this conversation. And yes, it's not fun to hear your own voice and to try to transcribe your own voice speaking, but you do learn a lot from the course of that conversation uh, that I think will help you to connect to a lot of these ideas that we've been going over in interpersonal communication. So I know I covered a lot uh, with this assignment. Are there any questions about uh, the interpersonal analysis essay? Again, I recommend really spending time this week to start to think about the conversation that you would like to have and how you might go about uh, reaching out to that person. I also recommend having a backup person or two in case somebody says no or turns out to not be available. So a couple weeks ago, I asked you to complete some mid-quarter feedback, just letting me know what's been going well for you in the course and some adjustments or changes that um, you would like to see in the course. Uh, so I wanted to let you know just a few things that I noticed uh, that I'll continue to do and make some changes to. Uh, the big change is a lot of people mentioned that having some extra time to complete the Canvas prompts uh, would be really useful. I don't like to give you work to do over the weekend, but I also want to support your economy and managing your own schedule and deciding when you would like to do work. Uh, so uh, from now on, the Canvas prompt will be due on Sundays, right? So we have a Canvas prompt number five this week. Rather than Friday, that prompt is due this Sunday by 11.59. So uh, you can still turn it in on Friday. I will still be able to grade those within a week of when they're turned in. Uh, but um, I do want to give you that additional flexibility uh, in timeline. Folks also mentioned kind of breaking up so that it's not kind of like a 45 minutes or longer period of more lecture-oriented content. So I'm trying to pace it a little bit more so that we have more opportunity for group activities and discussion and that we're not working through things quite as quickly and we have more time to talk about and share some of these key ideas and concepts from the course. So um, just know that we'll be continuing to do that, continuing to use things like practice questions and short debriefs that people mentioned were really helpful. Um, so um, do let me know if there's anything else that I can do to specifically help you as we're continuing to go on through the course. All right, so I know we had a lot of kind of updates and housekeeping to cover. So what I want to do is shift gears into talking about some of the new ideas from this week. This week, we are looking at the idea of conversation, of talking, right? What does it mean to communicate with other people? And also what it means to listen and be an effective listener. It's actually a common course that's entirely dedicated to it called Are You Listening? that is taught this winter. And so if you find listening interesting, that topic uh, will be even more explored in that course. So for your recording and reflection essay, I'm asking you to think about a conversation, right? And a conversation is something that I think is important for us to understand and break down, right? It's one of those things that we think to ourselves, we know it when we see it. We know what a conversation looks like, and we know what it feels like to have a good conversation with somebody else. In fact, you might think on some of the traits that you like to see in a good conversation. Oftentimes, in a good conversation, uh, somebody else is engaged, they're interested, you have something to talk about, 
There's this idea of reciprocity that you're both able to share and catch up. You feel maybe recharged uh, and you feel like you care and learn about this person through talking to them. So conversation is something that generally happens in a dyad, right? It's dyadic. Uh, a dyad means two people. So conversations generally happen between two people, whether you're speed dating, catching up, doing an office appointment, and so on. Uh, generally speaking, we use conversations to fulfill three different things. We use them to build relationships. So say uh, you are getting to know a roommate and you're trying to learn a little bit about your roommate, where they're from, what they like to do in their free time, what some of their interests are, right? Uh, that's a way of building up that relationship. They can also be used to maintain how many of you have regular phone calls with friends or family members. Yeah, so a number of you. We use things like phone calls, updates, uh, sometimes just texts in order to catch up with people. But we also use conversations, <laughs> ideally, to terminate relationships, uh, although your mileage may vary, vary on that. Uh, right? Um, if you've received a text breakup, then that would not be an example of conversations to terminate relationships. Oftentimes, uh, it's being seen as more respectful and engaged to choose a conversation to end a relationship with somebody else, whether it's romantic or parental, platonic, and so on, right? Ghosting is very common because we find ourselves unable to deal with the discomfort that comes in terminating relationships verbally. So conversations are used for social interaction. Pretty straightforward, we engage in conversations to understand and fulfill some of those social needs that we can't meet through interpersonal communication. There's a really cool case that's talked about in the reading for this week about how prisoners uh, were given um, less opportunity to talk to each other face to face, right? Um, and the idea was that maybe some crimes, uh, laundering and so on that were associated uh, with conversation would be removed. But what happened when there was less communication between inmates was that they found other ways to communicate. In particular, they would tap pipes and use Morse code in order to send messages across different cells. Uh, so conversation is something that's inevitable. We find ways to communicate with other people, even when restrictions exist, right? We had a lot of switches over to Zoom and digital platforms. It wasn't perfect, right? But there's a way to continue fulfilling a lot of those communication needs that we found ourselves unable to fulfill. So conversations fit into a two by two. So um, we have conversations that can be categorized based on a dialogue, a debate, discourse, or a diatribe. So uh, a good way to measure and think about conversations is to think about, first of all, um, is the conversation two-way or one-way? In a two-way conversation, that generally means that you and that other person have good reciprocity. You're exchanging information with that person in a way that feels meaningful or significant. So um, having a conversation where both of you talk about your days, uh, talk about what's been going on over the week, and you feel a good sense of balance, that would be two-way conversation, whereas one-way would just be somebody talking at you, for example, venting about um, a really challenging chemistry exam. There's also a question of whether our communication is considered to be cooperative or competitive. In cooperative communication, it's about meeting the needs of both people, right? So you're helping that other person to get their social needs met, to feel connected, to feel seen, to feel heard. In the idea of a competitive conversation, there's this idea that you and that other person have scarcity in the resources or things that you want out of that conversation. For example, the favor or support of somebody else. So this means that we have these four different types of communication uh, conversations that occur. One of them being a dialogue, right? So how many of you have ever read any of Plato's five dialogues? Perhaps for another course. Right, so um, a lot of Greek philosophers like Plato and Socrates um, are very well known for uh, readings in which they have this very long conversation. If you're familiar with the Socratic method, it's the idea that we continually ask questions, right? Socrates was seen as a very annoying person because he would constantly ask questions. Uh, but the idea here that the Greeks had 
was that through dialogue, through dialectic, through conversation with other people, we become closer to understanding and reaching the truth, right? We are able to explore and go in depth about a topic that was important or significant to us uh, through cooperative two-way communication, through dialogue. Competitive two-way competition, though, is a debate. So we have a number of debates that have been happening this year. Uh, for instance, the Oregon governorship, uh, House and Senate races in the United States. Uh, there have been a numerous amount of debates, including ones that have happened just this past week, right? And in a debate, people do have, generally speaking, pretty even time. However, um, the goal is not necessarily to listen to each other, uh, but to compete for people that they're trying to persuade or shore up, for example, swing voters, right? Uh, so a competitive two-way is a debate. If you were ever involved in debate, like in high school, uh, competitive debate means that you and that other person are engaging with the topic, but at the end of the day, there's a winner, there's a loser, uh, and that matters for uh, the goals that you and that other person have. One-way cooperative communication would be an example of discourse, right? So discourse would be something such as uh, a lecture, right, where somebody is speaking at you but doing so in a way that's designed to foster education or awareness about an issue. If you have a presenter or guest speaker, that would be an example of discourse as well. And then we have this idea of a diatribe. You can think about a diatribe as a rant, right? where somebody just wants to vent, they want to occupy space, they want to talk and talk and talk, uh, and they're not doing so in a way that gets you a word edgewise. It's not necessarily about uh, getting an update from you. It is somebody saying, oh, I can't believe what they said to me last week. I just went over to see my family and I'm really upset. Uh, I'm just going to vent and talk about this. In a diatribe, you are communicating so that you can get your meets met, uh, but you don't necessarily care about the needs of the other person. So this kind of fits in the ways that we think about conversation. So we use conversation to fulfill um, a variety of different communication needs. You can think back to Maslow's hierarchy, right? And this idea that some of the communication needs that we have are physical. So uh, they're very much about getting access to things like food and water, uh, having a conversation with somebody and saying, hey, um, I can't sleep when you're throwing parties in my dorm all the time. Is there a way that we can uh, make things a little quieter around you? We also have identity-based needs that we're fulfilling through conversation, right? So a lot of members of the LGBTQ community uh, use conversation as a way of coming out or of sharing their experiences with other people. And we use conversation to fulfill social needs. Maybe we're feeling with, really withdrawn and isolated. We haven't really talked to people. Uh, we miss talking to people and we choose to converse in order to get those met. So we use conversation to fulfill a variety of different needs and goals over time. In addition to that, it's a good idea to know the motives, right? Why do we choose to have uh, dialogue with other people, well, we do so in order uh, to fulfill certain things that we see as important. So one way that we choose to use conversation is to gain control. So for example, uh, maybe you are trying to get better control over policies and rules in your dorm. You've got roommates who are really loud, who are playing music all the time, and you would like them to be quieter, right? So you use conversation to uh, fulfill that need for control. Sometimes we use communication to relax, right? We're interested in just um, kicking back and having fun, you know, maybe having a really uh, relaxed conversation with somebody else. Sometimes we use communication for divergence uh, or avoidance. Uh, so if you have watched like any one of those classic sitcoms that has like a will they, won't they relationship, for example, um, a lot of the relationships on the show Friends, uh, The Office, uh, and so on, right? There is a big emphasis on this state. People are about to admit their feelings for each other, but then they change the subject and talk about something else. So oftentimes we'll use communication to change the subject, to divert from a topic. Uh, somebody asks, hey, how are classes going? And then you say, oh, that's a, a really nice new jacket you have there, right? That would be an example of escape through conversation. We use uh, conversation for inclusion, 
So maybe you are a new member of a club or activity on campus, and maybe after you went to their meeting, there's somebody from that club who talks to you and tries to get you to uh, hear a little bit about yourself to welcome you into that club. It's free. You can use that for the meeting. There's also this idea of, of course, using communication for affection, right? Expressing that you love somebody or using another type of love language to express your feelings for somebody else, uh, whether it's compliments or gestures, right? Sometimes the use of nonverbal communication plays a big role there. And then we also communicate for pleasure, right? For enjoyment or excitement. Maybe you have a friend who just has all these funny stories about their life. Uh, they have um, all sorts of really weird things that happen to them. And you just think it's fun to talk to them and hear their stories, like an uncle uh, or aunt who just has a really interesting life. So sometimes you communicate in that way too. So motives explain our desire or drive to engage in conversation. There's also this idea of self-disclosure. So self-disclosure, right, is the way that we choose to open ourselves up to other people. We're going to be talking about that more on Wednesday when we look at social penetration theory. Uh, but this idea is that through conversations, we oftentimes have a persona or mask or a way that we present ourselves to other people that's somewhat detached, right, and has some basic details. But over time, we open up and share more about ourselves. We disclose uh, for social integration, the more that we share and open about, uh, open up about ourselves to other people, the more we can engage in conversation and connect with other people. For example, you're talking um, about your week and you're talking about going up to Anthony Lakes, right? You might talk about your experience there uh, as a way of integrating with the topic and to manage our impressions with other people, right? So. One really big way that we use communication is in order to uh, impact how other people perceive and think about us. We think back earlier in the term, we have talked about the idea of the looking glass self, how you appear to other people, how you imagine yourself looking to other people. And that's something that's really important, right? We think about how we manage impressions with others uh, as a way of engaging in relationships. So if we think about how we manage ourselves, for instance, using social media, uh, sometimes there is a big gap between how we appear online, how we present ourselves, or how we have typed ourselves up to other people, and how we actually do it. We can think back to the show Catfit and how people have deceptive or false images of ourselves online uh, that don't match ourselves in real life as a way that we use impression management too. So uh, there might be a version uh, difference between how you present on social media, like on Instagram, you're showing all the cool places you travel uh, and the cool things you've had to eat, but in real life, your life is not nearly that exciting. So we manage our impressions, how we appear to other people in a few different ways. Uh, we might use self-description. For example, telling a story about how um, you went bungee jumping, right? Or you went to go see the Grand Canyon. You might use self-description to make yourself be interesting, engaging, worthy of conversation, something that's worth getting to know a little bit better. An account, right? Sometimes uh, people might have reputations uh, or impressions about you, and we use communication as a way of kind of trying to deny or downplay uh, what people say, right? So for instance, um, you know, again, you can think about just about any classic rom-com where somebody says, oh, um, I hear you're a little bit of a slacker or you're a little bit of a loner, right? Um, in fact, if you've watched like Lady and the Tramp, there's a whole song about how uh, the Tramp, right, is this loner character who uh, you shouldn't spend time with. And he's trying to rationalize and justify to himself, no, I'm a good person, I'm worth getting to know. We might apologize, right, or downplay an issue. Um, I'm so sorry that I came in late. Um, I really wasn't keeping track of time, right? We downplay an issue to try to manage our face and persona in that issue. Uh, entitlements and enhancements, that's the idea that we're taking credit or responsibility for something that happens, right? Uh, we use entitlements and enhancements to say, hey, um, I was in this group project and I developed this really great uh, visual that we use in our class presentation, right? That would be an example of you maximizing responsibility for your participation and work in the group and making yourself appear more positive. 
We also use flattery and favors, right? So flattery means that we choose to compliment somebody else, uh, speak highly of that other person, right? Under the idea that if we do, that they'll like us a bit more. And then lastly, uh, we might take on favors. Uh, hey, don't worry, I'll take the trash out, right? Especially if you find yourself new to a company or group or organization, oftentimes we'll use flattery and favors to people who might have positions of authority over us because we see that as positive to developing that relationship over time. So these are all ways that we manage our impressions uh, and how we appear to other people. So what I'd like you to do is to take some time on your own uh, to think about these four types of conversation that we've talked about. And with somebody that you talk to regularly, which of these types of conversations do you use the most? So this could be a roommate, friend, parent, family member, and so on. Uh, which of these four best aligns with uh, how you talk with this person? Then I want you to think about some of the communication motives that we've talked about. And which of those best explains your conversation with this person? For example, um, for control, for inclusion, et cetera. And then given some of the ideas here about impression management, how do you manage your impressions with this person? What do you do in order to present yourself in a particular way? So I'll ask you to write or type this for your attendance for today and have your name on it. Take some time to think about this and how you speak with this person.
when you have wrapped up this part, what I'd like you to do is to find a partner or group of three to share what you see as the similarities and differences about how you all converse uh, with your selected people. Go ahead and wrap up your conversation. All right. So uh, thinking about this conversation is a chance for you to start to brainstorm and consider what conversation you'd like to explore for uh, your essay in this class. So do take some time to continue to think about what you'd like to explore here. Uh, we talked about this upcoming assignment, talked about some of the needs that we use in conversation and how we manage things like identity and self-disclosure. We'll be talking a little bit more about self-disclosure, including social penetration theory and listening on Wednesday. So uh, please either email or pass forward your attendance for today. Have a great rest of your morning, and I'll see you again on Wednesday. All right, bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.